Well, it, it is a privilege to be here again, and uh, I, uh, it, it came to me in a blinding flash that I should speak to you on the subject of uh, death and resurrection and bread and wine this weekend, seriously enough. And so that is what I intend to do. And uh, what I have to say is I think of great practical value to your life and my life, um, but it's also something that is philosophical and scientific and bears on the entire course of human history. And it's something that... Uh, for some of you at least, this may uh, involve thinking about yourself in a new way. And so what I'm going to try to do is talk about this subject one way tonight and a different way tomorrow night and yet a third way on uh, Sunday. Now, is this water in here? The last time it was vodka. Okay. Now, listen to uh, Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. You know this passage, but hear it again as we begin. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, we want to think for just a few minutes here about how bread is made and how wine is made and the difference between the two. When everything that is real in this world is true to the Bible, and everything that's in the Bible is true to what's really real in the world. And so if God selects to create bread and wine and the processes that go into making them, and then he selects to put them at the heart of his worship, there are reasons for that. And as we think about those reasons, they can become very practical and valuable. How is bread made? Well, you all know that you can make bread very easily. You just follow the direction. It's not hard to make bread, especially what the Bible calls bread, which is like pita bread or flat bread. You don't even have to worry about it rising. All you have to do is take flour and salt and uh, yeast, maybe, and water, and it doesn't have to be a whole lot more than that, and make it warm, and it becomes some kind of bread. You can read in Leviticus chapter 2 the different kinds of bread, from crackers to puffy bread, to just plain old meal with oil poured on it, that was counted as bread among these people in the ancient world, and that God counts as bread. It's simple to make bread. And as soon as a crop of uh, wheat or rye or barley or millet or spelt or whatever is, uh, can be harvested, you can take it right home that day, make bread out of it, and within an hour have bread. Or a couple hours at the most if you make it rise. Bread doesn't take time, it's not complicated, and you can make it by following the rules. Wine is not so. Wine is very difficult to make. Wine is complicated. You can follow the directions and make wine, and it'll still turn to vinegar. Try it sometimes. You may be able to make wine that's okay, but if you want wine like the kind that sells out here for ten, fifteen, twenty dollars a bottle, it takes a tremendous amount of wisdom. You can't make it just by following rules. Wine involves wisdom. When you harvest the grapes. You can't make wine in two or three hours. It takes a long time to make wine. You can make vinegar fairly fast. You can make wine real fast. Now, these are differences between bread and wine, and they're differences that are important. Because in the Bible, bread is associated with priests and with obedience, and wine is associated with kings and with wisdom. 
And what we want to do tonight is think just a little bit about the differences between priests and kings and the differences between obedience and wisdom because Thursday night a long time ago, Jesus told us to use bread and wine in our worship and so that's on our minds tonight. Another difference between bread and wine is that if bread is alpha food and wine is omega food. The alphabet goes from A to Z. You have bread in the morning when you wake up. You have wine when you're finished working and you relax at the end of the day. It's not ordinarily a good idea to start off with wine or if you're a really stiff Presbyterian like me, it may take shots to make you relax. But uh, it's not a good idea to start the day off. Okay? When you get up in the morning, you have toast. Uh, you have something to give you energy to go through the day, but wine is for relaxing when the work is finished. Another difference between bread and wine, which says the same thing, is you don't ordinarily give a lot of wine to your children. They get some in church, but that's probably about the only time they get very much. Okay. Now, we adults, we can put down several glasses like this and be okay. But you kids can't have that because you're not old enough. Okay? The wine you get in church here is just a little foretaste of what you get to have more of when you get older. But right now, as little kids, you can have all the bread you want. And when you grow up and become an adult, you don't eat bread anymore. You just drink wine. <laughs> or beer, which is liquid bread. Um, it really is. In the Bible, it is. On the table of showbread, you have beer in the tabernacle. There's no wine in the tabernacle, only bread and liquid bread. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, as adults, we continue to eat bread, but we add wine to it. See, this difference between beginning and end, between child and adult, corresponds to one of the most important differences between priest and king in the Bible. We think of priests and kings and prophets as all existing at the same time. They're all 30 years old, and the priest leads in worship, and the king runs the nation, and the prophet tells them what God wants them to hear. Now, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but that is only secondary to the most important thing about prophet, priest, and king, which is that they exist in historical order. A priest is, by definition, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. A priest the word Cohen in Hebrew, you ever know any Jewish person whose name was Cohen? That's the word priest. Okay? It means palace servant. A priest is a palace servant. And the servants in David's palace were called priests because they were servants of the king. And the priest has a very simple life. All a priest has to do is to keep the incense burning so that the God's house smells good and to prepare the food uh, uh, for offering on the sacrifices. He, he keeps the lamp trimmed so that the, the light burns in God's house. Um, he teaches the law of God by reading out loud to the people what God himself said. You know, most people in the ancient world couldn't read. It was a priest's job to know how to read and to read out loud what God had said. And if you were a priest, you had a very simple life. You just obeyed what God said, deviating neither to the right nor to the left. It's time to do a sacrifice. You bring a pig in here, nope, can't use a pig. You bring a deer, nope, can't use a deer. You bring a sheep, okay, now you're a priest. You've got to inspect it. Any dark spots on that sheep? Any blemishes? You know, any ringworm? Any uh, AIDS? Anything problematic with this sheep? Nope, sheep looks okay. So now we know exactly what to do. And it's all laid out in Leviticus chapter 1. You lay hands on it, you cut its throat, you cast blood in a bowl, you start the fire on the altar, you wash the legs and the guts, you take the other, the clean parts and put them on the fire, then you wash the leg and the guts. You see, I got it wrong, but I'm not a priest. I don't do this every day. Then you put it on the fire. There's a specific set of things you do. You just follow the direction, like making bread. It's simple. You just follow the rules. And in fact, Israel is a nation of priests in Mount Sinai, and that's when God gives the law. And the law consists of a whole series of things you're supposed to do and not do, and it's not terribly complicated. The priest lives by right and wrong. It's fairly simple. And bread is associated with that. We read in Leviticus chapter 10, and you can find the verse. 
But God tells the priest, you must never drink wine when you come into my house to do my work. It makes sense. You don't want people drinking on the job. And that's what God says to these priests. The book of Hebrews, Paul says, the priest never gets to sit down. He doesn't get to sit down. He works when he's in there. And he doesn't drink wine. But if you look at the pictures of kings in the Bible, you find that Joseph, uh, that the king has a baker and a cupbearer. That the king sits on his throne, and while he sits on his throne, he drinks wine. So that Nehemiah is a cupbearer who serves wine to the king. So that in the book of Esther, on seven occasions, King Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus means the great one, King Limbaugh, is uh, being served wine. Okay? He's uh, pictured as enthroned in rest in a house and being served wine. Uh, this simple life of priests, let's contrast it a bit with kings. To be a king is not just a matter of obeying and doing right and not doing wrong. The king has to rule by wisdom. Now, the, the single example, I mean, the great example of that in the Bible, you remember, is at the beginning of Solomon's reign, because Solomon is the great example of wisdom. He wrote Proverbs, he wrote Ecclesiastes, he wrote Song of Solomon, and he almost certainly wrote Job. He is the great wisdom person. And they bring these two bad women who had each a baby, and one of them's baby died, and so they are both claiming that the baby that's still alive is theirs. And one woman says, that's my baby, and the other one says, no, it's my baby. And so they bring him to Solomon, and how is Solomon going to solve this? Well, he can look all day long in the laws of Moses, and he ain't going to find any answer to this question. He cannot solve this by obeying the law. He has to solve it by wisdom. So you remember what he says. He says, let me kill the baby. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. What, Mo what Solomon actually prepares to do on the surface of it is to disobey God's law. So you see, wisdom involves some subtlety. And I'll tell you the secret of wisdom and the secret of politics, which is something priests don't have to worry about. Priests don't have to worry about politics. But kings do. The priest can choose between right and wrong, between obeying and disobeying, because his life is simple. The king has to choose between the lesser of two evils. And that is always true in, the, in politics. Even in church politics, if you become a ruler in the church. The reason is you've got all these people around, and if you are unwise, and a bunch of them leave, then you don't have the people you're supposed to deal with with you anymore. And things can get even worse. The good example of this is David. David is saddled with Joab for his entire reign. There's nothing he can do about Joab. Joab is his cousin. And David owes Joab. And of course, after the incident with Uriah, David really owes Joab. And Joab knows things about David. David can't ever get rid of him, but Joab causes trouble his whole reign. Joab is David's limp. As Jacob limped, so David limped because he's got Joab. But he can't get rid of him because if he got rid of him, it would explode the political situation. And then there goes the kingdom that he's supposed to rule over. So he has to make decisions about what is the best way to handle something. And it's never perfect. Now, you don't acquire the ability to do that unless you spend a number of years being a priest and learning right and wrong. So you have to grow up as a child and be obedient and be spanked when you're disobedient and learn right and wrong. And once you get that down inside yourself, then you can have these challenges where you've got much more difficult and complex decisions to make. And you kind of have to grope your way along. Uh, I think sometimes Christians get involved in politics. So we look at the world of politics and say, well, there's got to be a completely right way to do this that's absolutely perfect. Well, there isn't. Case. In almost no political situation do you have that luxury. Somebody's going to be mad, and something's not going to work out perfect. You have to make decisions. The best example in common life is a commander on the battlefield. If you are a private in the infantry, all you've got to do is obey. And your life is simple. You know how to take care of your M1 carbine rifle. You know it weighs 9.5 pounds. 
Okay? You know all the details of it. You know its muzzle velocity. You know how to break it down and put it back together again and clean it and then you sleep. Okay? And you know how to run. And you know how to pull a grenade and how to throw it. You don't throw it like a baseball. You throw it like this. You know these simple things if you're in the infantry. But if you are a king in the military, if you're a commander, you have to pick some guys out for suicide missions. You have to decide that this platoon over here is going to go into this nest of enemy machine guns and you know that they're all going to be wiped out. But if they don't do it and draw the fire, these guys over here won't be able to go around behind and get them. Now, what kind of decision is that? You know, that's a terribly hard decision. That's not a right and wrong decision. That's a lesser of two evils decision. That's what commander has to make. Don't be naive. And kings have to make that decision. And real politicians have to make that decision. Bill Clinton doesn't have to make that kind of decision. He just decides which girl he wants. But real politicians have to make those kinds of decisions. Okay? That's, that's, that's life. And that's wisdom. And that's wine. It's much more complex and much more sensitive and much more delicate operation to make a bottle of wine than to make a piece of bread. There's one thing beyond this, you know, and that is the prophet. Uh, in the Bible, and we'll talk about this more uh, next Wednesday or Thursday, after I'm gone. A prophet in the Bible, there's two kinds of prophets. There's the prophet who comes and says what God wants to be said. But the full prophet is a man who, by wisdom, by his words alone, changes the course of history. The Bible says in Proverbs that God, by wisdom, founded the world. Well, a king does not found the world by wisdom. He doesn't make a new world by wisdom. That's not what David or Solomon did. They just tried to do their best to rule the world that they had in front of them. A prophet goes a step further. A prophet is a person who has matured to the point that he knows exactly what things to say to change the way people think so that they are reoriented and history takes a different course. That's the prophetic function. It may be exercised by a young man like Daniel, but it is, at its fullest it's exercised by an old man, by an elder. If we move from child to maturity, then with kings, from priest to king, with prophet we get the eldership. And the elder is no longer able to go out and fight. He doesn't have strength. His knees don't cooperate with him. We were talking about this today. And my knees are going to hurt when I step down here after standing here still for the last for half an hour. It's going to hurt my knees to step down there. You can feel sorry for me. But it's something you young people have to look forward to. It'll happen to you. Okay? And your knees won't cooperate as well as they do when you're young. It just happens. And at, at the end of life, you don't do things anymore. It's speaking. Okay? The king acts. The elder speaks. And what he says, if he has really learned wisdom, if he learned obedience, he's wise enough to be a king. If he really learns wisdom, then he has the super wisdom to know exactly what things to say to cause David to repent instantly. To know exactly what things to say to cause his grandchildren to look at the world in a new way and to start things a different way. That's what a prophet does. Uh, a prophet is the most mature form. We won't have much to say about that because that's really almost on the other side of bread and wine. Well, a couple of more points on this, and then we'll stop for tonight now that I've got you to thinking about it. Thinking about bread. Bread is for priests. Bread is simple. Priests just do what's right and wrong. They're like kids. Wine, mm, wine is complicated. Very easy to turn wine to vinegar if you're not careful. It takes wisdom to put that stuff together and put it in a dark room and have it become Okay, Cabernet Sauvignon rather than vinegar. That takes wisdom. So there's this transition between the two. And you'll notice that Jesus says, what it says is, and you know this, you'll see it tonight. You watch. You watch your pastor do this. Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks for it and he gave it to his disciples. No. Jesus took some bread, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it and gave it out. Now, this business of breaking the bread 
means that between the priestly phase of life and the kingly phase of life, there's a crisis. Now that crisis can happen, and we're going to be talking about this, I want you to understand this, the most important thing I can say to you this weekend. But that crisis is seen in history when at the end of Israel's priestly period in the days of Eli, God kills Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and he kills Eli because of their sin. And he tears the tabernacle in half, and he sends the Ark of the Covenant off to the Philistines, and he basically wrecks the whole system. And he brings it back again with David and Solomon. And Solomon builds the temple and the priesthood is restored with the king. And at the end of that period, at the end of the period of the king, God kills the sons of King Zedekiah. And he kills King Zedekiah. And he kills off almost all the kings. And he starts again with Daniel and Ezekiel as very young men, as prophets starting something new on the other side of that second death and judgment experience. <coughs> In our lives, your life and mine, God is in the process of making us into bread and then from time to time breaking us. And that process of breaking your life and the suffering that you go through gives you wisdom so that you become more like wine. And when you're real young, you don't quite understand this, but it's true. And with most people, there is some type of crisis around the middle of their life where God takes hold of all the things he has baked into them thus far and breaks it. And they go through a real hard time. And there are many different hard times, one for each person, each unique. Some are harder than others, some feel harder. But on the other side of that hard time, is a, a transformation that gives you wisdom and you know much better how to be a king. Because in the first part of your life, God is essentially putting bread into you. In the second part of your life, this really starts when you're a baby and you start coming to the Lord's table as, a, as an infant, or as, a, as soon as you're old enough to eat. But the wine becomes more important in the second part of your life. And what God does basically in your life is he switches out all the blood in your bloodstream for wine. So that at the end, Paul says, I, when I die, I am poured out like a drink offering. God has filled me up with wine, and now my death is a pouring out of this wine. So that there are, almost, there are two deaths in our life. There's a death that comes when God converts the bread into wine, and then there's another death that comes when you actually die and expire, when God converts your wine into something new for the kingdom. These transformations are the way God deals with us. And now, I don't have time to go further into that. What I'm going to do tomorrow is look at Abraham and Jacob and Joseph, and we're going to look at these men. And what we're going to see is that God spent the first part of their lives adding things to them, and then in the middle of their lives, He brought them through a crisis that transformed them into something new and far more effective than before. In each person's case, that's different. So because that's true in your life and mine, it happens in big ways, it happens in small ways, it happens in, you know, week by week, it can happen uh, in a big crisis in the middle of your life. As I say, it happens that way with a great many people. Uh, I think probably one way or the other it happens with everybody. This transformation, this death and resurrection, is made possible because of what Jesus did, and it is represented here in this ritual we're about to do. Uh, and that is given to us. And so, tomorrow we'll continue with this, and we'll make an application to the lives of these patriarchs and see much more fully what it means for God to make us into bread, to break us, then make us into wine, and pour us out and how that's the way his kingdom is growing in us as individuals and in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us ignorant about the way you've made the world, but that you have made a world and given us a scripture that totally corresponds to one another. We also thank you that you're working with our lives, that we are your experiment, and that you are totally in control of all the factors, and you're totally in control of all the results. 
We ask that tonight as we come again around your table, that you would make us more fully the kind of priestly bread that you want us to be and give us the wisdom and the kingly wisdom that comes from the wine as well and help us to live more faithfully as priests and with greater insight and understanding as kings. We commit ourselves again to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.